Um, yeah, my name is Ben Gray. I'm the Assistant Superintendent for Innovative Learning and Communications in District 59, which is a district just outside of Chicago. And um, I was a teacher prior to becoming an administrator uh, for eight years and then uh, became an instructional technology coordinator and then uh, chief information officer and uh, now the role that I currently hold. So a lot of the work that I do is uh, working on uh, educational technology, um, focusing on innovative learning, uh, modern learning, uh, and also communications for our district. So I want to spend some time um, this evening or afternoon, wherever you're located and or whenever you're watching, uh, to talk about um, what does it mean to prepare students to be successful for life. And uh, as we think about this, there's a few things that I, I want to talk about uh, really to set the stage. Part of the conversation as we talk about um, uh, really uh, modern learning, if we're talking about um, you know, learning that happens that is, is genuine and authentic um, in the lives of students sometimes isn't the kind of learning that uh, we see in what happens um, in a more traditional education. And um, I think we need to start off just asking the question, what is learning? Because if we're going to talk about authentic learning, uh, we need to first, I think, think in terms of what happens in learning in general um, because a lot of times schools aren't necessarily uh, built to accommodate uh, the kind of learning uh, that, that students are experiencing when they're outside the walls of our schools um, and i think it's really important you know we talk a lot about this in in our district um, because teaching and learning is is intensely personal and it's something that that we all uh, i think believe a lot in in the way that we uh, you know kind of create our craft and what's important for teachers and and students and and any educator to understand right now is when we're talking about the modern context of learning and we're talking about that it's different it doesn't mean that what we have done in the past is wrong uh, or what we're doing is wrong and needs changing and i think that's tough sometimes because when people hear a lot of the, the current narrative around reforming and changing education, it feels like it's an indictment on our practices. And that's not at all, and I hope that everyone understands that's not at all um, the approach that, that hopefully you hear uh, that I discuss uh, today. I want to talk more about the fact that the world has changed. And it's not only changing that we know, but it's changed. And we need to, to uh, think, confront that reality as we think in terms of, so how does education respond to the fact that things are very different now than they were 10 or 15 years ago? And, and so when we talk about changing education, again, I hope you understand that I'm, I'm not saying that what you're doing is wrong um, at all. I'm saying just some things that we need to think about in terms of how are we structuring learning and what does learning look like? So. To, to begin, I want to briefly talk about that idea that what is learning, and that sounds like a really basic and, and almost um, offensive question to some degree because it's what we all deal with every day and the work that we do is learning. Um, but I think sometimes we need to take a step back and think, well, what actually is learning and how do we learn? And I think that Seymour Papert, uh, who is just an incredible thinker, uh, he created a, a model uh, that he called the three phases of learning. And he admits that this is very, very oversimplified. So this is not a, uh, a real in-depth look at what happens in learning, but I think it's an important model for us to, to look at and address. Uh, because he looks and he talks about phase one is universally successful learning. And this picture right here is a picture of my son. Uh, this was the first time that he went out and played in snow. And Papert says that phase one, the, the universally successful learning, when you watch a, a baby um, and watch a toddler and watch a child in their very early years, so these are the preschooling years, essentially, before they go to formal education, and watch how they make sense of their world. So what I love about this picture is my son is really investigating the snow. So first time he puts his hand in it, lifts up his hand and says, what, what happens as a result of my movement and the material that I'm interacting with? And we see this happen with babies as they learn to walk. Uh, we see this happen uh, with children as they uh, begin to talk. And they do it naturally at a time that's appropriate for them and their development. And by and large, the reason that, that Papert calls this universally successful learning is by and large, 
children do this and, and, and learn successfully on their own uh, without formal uh, intervention from parents. And we know there are certain cases where uh, there are, are warning signs that you know, if a child by the age of two or three uh, is not walking, then we would look to say, okay, is something happening and do we need to, to, to look at something developmentally um, with the child or, or um, if they're not talking at a certain age. But, but some kids talk really early and some kids walk really late and they do it at the time that's appropriate for them. And so we watch kids as they grow in those really early years, just being universally successful with their learning um, again, with minimal uh, structure put on that learning experience for them. Uh, and then Pepper talks about phase three, and I know I'm skipping phase two, but I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, phase three is the intellectually awake adult. And I love that phrase, the intellectually awake adult. And he says, not everyone gets there. And the first time I read that, I, I, I kind of chuckled and thought he was, you know, being um, silly. And I guess sometimes you can feel that when you um, watch interactions that people have um, in the current context of politics and things like that, where you think, okay, yeah, not everyone is an intellectually awake adult. Um, but if you stop and think about it, Papert's right. Not everyone becomes uh, the intellectually awake adult. Something happens between phase one and phase three. Uh, that prevents people from becoming uh, that, that uh, reaching that stage. Uh, and between those two phases, uh, that's what he calls phase two. And Papert says that phase two is that narrow and dangerous passage between. And this is where we live as educators. And, and this is something to me that I think about all the time. And something as educators, I think, it should keep us up at night because we're thinking about the fact that are we working from those early phases of our kids being successful in their learning and moving them through to becoming intellectually awake adults. And there are a lot of things that we may put in place in systems that work against kids becoming intellectually awake. And I want to talk more about that because I think that's part of the key and the foundation of talking about authentic learning, learning that takes place naturally um, and that we all can be successful with. But sometimes with the best intentions, we create systems that keep people from becoming intellectually awake as adults. Um, and I think that we need to address one other big important element when we're trying to create authentic learning experiences um, or authentic learning environments for kids. Um, and that's this idea of how do we define success in learning? Uh, because right now we have a public narrative in education that is working very hard to define success in a very narrow metric uh, of what kids can do. Um, and it does not present an opportunity to look at all the nuances and, and the richness of authentic learning uh, in very, very important ways. And so what we see is things like uh, school ratings. And we see uh, school quality ratings and rankings uh, that people look at. And, and this is an article from uh, a researcher uh, out of the East Coast named Jack Schneider. He's done tremendous work. Uh, I strongly, strongly recommend that you look into his work. Um, if, if you're struggling or working through uh, in your district or your area, how people are defining the quality of your school and using measures that truly don't show or demonstrate what kids are capable of. Uh, because in a lot of cases, the school quality rankings that we're using and that we're relying on and that websites like greatschools.org and other websites that try to provide a ranking for schools uh, don't tell us what we, what we think that they're telling us. And I think a lot of educators, educators understand that, but it's tough to help the public understand that we want a much broader definition of success in our schools. And I really love this quote. Um, by Jack that says, as research indicates, out-of-school factors like family and neighborhood account for roughly 60% of the variance in student test scores. Teachers, by contrast, uh, so this is the largest in-school influence, uh, which are teachers, that accounts for only about 10% of a child's uh, success, uh, specifically in test scores. This is not their success overall in life, but this is success in a standardized test score. It says, tests convey little else about the many things parents and other stakeholders care about. 
Consequently, when those external to a school community turn to test scores for information, they're likely to end up with a picture that's both, in, both incomplete and inaccurate. Uh, because a, a test, a standardized test, um, what's so interesting about those test scores is they're actually most strongly correlated to family income level, um, more so than they're correlated to uh, IQ, more so than they're correlated to grade level equivalency, the things that standardized test scores can predict uh, with the greatest level of accuracy is uh, is family income, uh, which we can see here. Uh, there's so much of a uh, child's performance that is due to factors outside of school. And again, this is so important. If you're seeking to create learning experiences for students that are built on authentic learning and, and learning that's meaningful and long lasting, basing or creating a curriculum that's main focus is to increase standardized test scores uh, does very little to ensure students' long-term success. And if you get a chance, this podcast that Jack put together, um, I think in particular all of his work is great, but this one is really excellent. It's the mismeasurement of schools, data, real estate, and segregation. So Jack talks about the fact that Again, in most cases, uh, in many cases, that those, uh, school, those school scores uh, on those websites are really a proxy for, um, for income level of, of the families. And he breaks down the idea. And, and this is something that we have to confront because in many cases, communities are very interested in the test scores because they reflect out on uh, websites like real estate websites that provide a ranking and then people are going to uh, look at homes or make decisions based on what they think is the quality of a school. And again, this is so tough to work against because if this is our narrative and if this is the metric of school success, then that really keeps us from being able to embrace uh, a true authentic learning context. And so let's talk kind of a, an example of what this looks like. Um, this is an awesome example from uh, Tony Wagner and Ted Dintersmith in their book, Most, like, Most Likely to Succeed. And they talk about this uh, Lawrenceville School exam experiment that Lawrenceville School did to high school. And at the end of the year, they tested uh, their, I believe it was their junior class. Uh, and they gave all the juniors a test. It was kind of a comprehensive final exam over the course of the year. And in June, the students scored an 87% on average. This is the average score of all the students who took it, uh, scored an 87%. They then went, came back again of September of that year. So when students went on summer break, came back in September, and they administered that same test. And actually, it was interesting because they didn't even administer the same test. Uh, they realized um, or said that they realized that there's some of the information was a little bit too specific, so they tried to simplify the test a little bit. So they made it a little easier, and even making it easier, the average score in September was a 58%. And this shows that in a lot of cases, what we're looking and valuing in education is content acquisition. Um, and we see the long-term ramifications of, uh, of a test prep or of a content-centric uh, schooling. And I'm not saying that there's not a place for content. I'm going to get to that in a minute. But I think what happens when we make content our goal and our primary goal for acquisition is there's a reality we have to, to look at um, in that the long-term retention of that content uh, is lost quickly. And it's interesting to see right now there's a movement uh, in, in um, the U.S. certainly to move uh, finals before winter break in, in a lot of cases. So districts are starting earlier starting earlier in the summer so students can take their final exams before winter break. And if you think about that, the, the, the worry and one of the big reasons why they want that is they're worried about the, the two-week span or however long your winter break is, that over that time, students will lose what they're learning and, and, and what they're remembering before they take the finals. And what does that say about our long-term hope for the retention of that content if we're worried about two weeks? And this exam, this, this is the Lawrenceville School, shows that there's a, a very steep forgetting curve uh, with content when that's our goal. And the other stat that, that is so interesting to me um, is 27%. And 27, that this number represents 
uh, there was a study done two years ago, and only 27% of people are currently working in a field uh, that is directly related to their major in college. And so we've done so much work to talk about college and career readiness uh, by making sure kids take courses as early as possible and try to get algebra as early as possible and, and, and really try to work on, again, the content-centric focus. When you see only 27% of people uh, right now in the industry are working in a field that's related to their major. So that means 73% of people are working in a job that they had no formal training for. So how are they successful in that job? What prepared them for success in life when they're working something, a job that they haven't been uh, trained in? And the average student changes their major in college three to five times, and the average adult changes their career eight to 10 times. So living in that reality, setting the stage for, that's the reality of the world we're living in. And how do we properly prepare kids or even adequately or, or, or prepare kids well for this modern world? Uh, this great book, that another um, Ted Denter Smith reference, if you haven't read what school could be, uh, would highly recommend uh, this book. It's not a perfect book, but it's, it's a really good book. And I think it's a great uh, book to study uh, with staff, to study with uh, the community, with parents, to help them understand. It does a really nice job of laying out Again, what are the current realities of the world and how can we structure school to match what those uh, realities are? And in our district, um, what we worked toward to try to embrace the idea of authentic and modern learning is a couple years ago, we started a process where uh, we met with a group, open invitation for any staff members who are interested to come together to say, let's create outcomes as a district that we're going to commit to that we believe are critical for student success, long-term success in life. Because going back to that 27%, if a child uh, is equipped with these skills, then it doesn't matter how many times they change their major, it doesn't matter how many times they change their career, they're positioned in life to choose any path and change their mind and they're ready to have success in whatever they encounter. So we look really deeply at, uh, at as many skills as we could think of, uh, kind of came together, uh, brought together a list of, of 21st century skills, Tony Wagner skills, there's a number of different places we gathered. We listed them all out and then we worked from that list and worked down and our district created um, our nine district outcomes. And if you go to our website, um, ccsd59.org slash district outcomes, uh, you'll see this page. And, and what I like about this page is that it shows not just what our nine outcomes are, um, which are in the gray box on the left, um, but they actually break down. They provide a definition for each uh, of those outcomes, and then they create a continuum for what that could look like across grade bands. So you can see, and like in a lot of cases, a good example is collaboration. In a lot of cases in education, if you have a, a group of educators come together in a room and you ask them, what's, the, what's your definition of collaboration? You're likely to get many, many different definitions as you talk um, to all the different educators. So we realized we needed to create a definition for that um, that we can all work from. And so if you go to that site, if you go to our district outcome site, you'll see the definition we work from, and then you'll see the, the, the continuum of those skills broken out. What would it look like uh, in K2 in, in 3.5? And actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a chance and I'm gonna, let's see, I'm gonna go to the site just because I wanna show you. Uh, so this is our district outcome site. And I wanna show you what I meant by this. So we have the definition of the of the outcome and then broken down by we broke it down into four different elements for each so i'll use collaboration as an example since i i brought it up so our definition of collaboration is working with others to achieve a common goal and then we created the four different elements again to try to operationalize a a, a working definition that we can all work from so you see those elements and then if i'm a, a second or third grade teacher I have some ideas uh, in this column of what would that look like in my classroom. Uh, it's something that we think is really important to inform what staff are doing. Uh, beyond that, we also then created applied outcomes. So for each of our content areas, we said social science is a good example. We said, what does it take to be a social scientist in the world? What skills are, are important? Um, what does it mean to be a scientist, to be a mathematician, to be a, a reader, a writer? Um, and again, we broke these down 
uh, into bands so we can see exactly how that should look in our curriculum if we want to engage this type of true authentic learning. And then we also did the same for understandings. And I know I'm just I feel like I'm just saying a lot of words right now. Um, and it's hard to, you know, in, in, in 30, 35 minutes to to explain what this can look like uh, in a in a curriculum. Because we took all of these then and we created and we have been we're in the process of rebuilding our curriculum K-8 and every content area um, and and all we're a K-8 district. So in every grade level, every content area, uh, working with our staff, uh, identifying resources, we're in the second year of this process. Uh, we still have a lot of work to do, a lot of area for growth. Uh, but what I'm really proud of is the fact that we're basing this work in these skills and these understandings that are critically important uh, for student success long term. Um, and it's not just a fact of content acquisition uh, that kids are likely to forget a percentage of as they get older. Um, content, again, has a really important place because when you put it in its right place, so I'll use social science as an example. So time continuity and change. So how do you uh, teach someone that devoid of content? You can't, and that's where the content comes in and becomes this really rich, uh, wonderful conversation. And, and it's a great example that, um, that I use that Science Leadership Academy in Philadelphia shared with us a, a few years ago, um, that their junior world history class, on the first day of junior world history, they show a picture of uh, the Twin Towers uh, in New York. And they pose a question and they just say, how did we get here? And that's their world history for the whole year because they spend the rest of the year deconstructing and working backwards to say, how did we get here? as a society, um, as humans, what happened? And they start really kind of deconstructing and, and looking through uh, ideas of, uh, it could be immigration policy, it could be different cultural interactions, it's the history of dynasties and it works all the way back, but it doesn't march through history in, in a linear way that starts kids all the way back in, in a society where they feel so disconnected from it works from current and works then backward to that um, and it increases their interest, which I think is so incredibly powerful. Um, so we're gonna take a, another chance here and a risk and I wanna show a video uh, of kind of what we put together to explain some of this uh, in context to share publicly of what do we mean by modern learning? and What does that mean in our district? So I'm gonna try to show um, this video and you can let me know if, if it doesn't work then Erin can um, show it from her control I believe. Um, so let's see if this works. The world is not only changing, it has changed. Information has never been more readily available and accessible and facts that used to require memorization in order to be useful can now be retrieved immediately by any device connected to the internet. The usefulness of facts is not in their recalling but in their application. This reality is not a diminishing or diluting of deep thinking. Rather, the availability of information now frees us to focus on developing thinking skills that broaden and challenge the mind in ways that rote memorization simply cannot. Regardless of our personal preference or comfort, rapid change and advancement will remain an integral part of life for the foreseeable future. This will be the reality our students will face when they emerge from the completion of their formal education. And this reality is what prompts us to embrace modern learning. What becomes critical as students, parents, and teachers is to understand what modern learning is and what it is not. It is not an abandonment of all past practices and foundational learning skills or content. It is an amplification of learning through the affordances of our modern world. It is an educational approach that seeks to create a learning experience that will prepare students for the realities of our world. The approach builds upon foundational skills such as reading, writing, and math and amplify student learning through the development of our nine district outcomes. Modern learning matches the learning that takes place in schools with the realities of the modern workplace and life in order to most effectively prepare students for success today and for their future. For more information about our approach to modern learning, please visit our website at ccsd59.org slash modern learning. So I think an important piece of the discussion is the idea that Technology plays an important role in modern learning, uh, but it's not the, the goal of modern learning. Uh, in the video you heard uh, say that 
it, the content still, it's not a displacement of content. Content still has an important role, um, but we also want to match the affordances of, of technology in the modern world. And I think a lot of cases, this is sort of what happens. And this is my daughter. Uh, this is the first time that she went to uh, an Easter egg hunt uh, a few years ago. And I think this is, all of us have lived this moment at some point uh, who work in educational technology, where we get really excited about a thing. We get really excited about a one-to-one -one initiative. We get really excited about a new tool that just came out. We get real excited about AR or VR or whatever it may be. And we get it in our hands and we start using it. And it's like this moment of, really, that was it? You know, and that's what my daughter, I think in this picture is she got all dressed up she got the bunny ears on she got all excited and then she's looking down to be like that's all i got was this basket full of a few eggs and that's what it feels like to us and i think that we need to contextualize the role of technology in learning and and to me i believe the most important role of technology is that it amplifies human potential um, it, it, it allows us to do things that we couldn't do prior to the advent of that technology and i think it it, it, it amplifies all of who we are and we see this currently in our current context of society that it amplifies the good parts of who we are but it also equally amplifies the bad parts of who we are and you see it a lot on social media and the interactions and trying to have a constructive meaningful dialogue on social media is incredibly challenging because of that amplification uh, but it does allow us to do things that we couldn't do prior to the advent of that and on our website, on, on our Innovative Learning and Communications website, this is where I think looking at tools, not just looking at tools to get tools, not just looking at something to say, oh, there's this out here, there's this new app, there's this new whatever it may be. It's almost that solution in search of a problem because, oh, look, I can do this, but why would I want to do this? And how does this accelerate or amplify uh, what my students can do in the way that they're learning? And I think tools that are incredibly important, we use uh, Google as our backbone. And, and I think that allowing that collaborative nature of what Google uh, apps can do uh, and as schools over the last you know, five to seven years have been embracing that, realizing, or 10 years, it's been a while now that they're embracing and realizing how that changes the way students can interact with each other. Um, and tools, obviously, Apara, which we're a customer of and think that they do uh, a great job with helping us uh, provide opportunities for teachers and students to interact in so many different ways. Um, and we talk about that. If you go to our website, you can click on the Innovative Learning uh, tab and or, or link, and you can see uh, all the different tools we use, uh, including Google Apps, including Hapara, including a, a number of different apps we use on our devices. And our goal, though, through all of this is to work hard uh, to amplify human potential. Um, and, and I have uh, one more video, and I'm going to talk a little bit about student agency um, and be mindful of the time here. Um, but a few years ago, we had the opportunity to um, to go to the White House to to um, help launch the the Future Ready movement um, and the Connect Ed movement. Um, and it was an incredible experience, uh, but one that I think. Um, more so than the, than the fact that we were able to to be guests there and to be a part of this, um, to me was was the the request to to create this video for it because um, what I love about this video is that these are our students and none of these moments or uh, these uh, you know shots are staged. Um, this is really what's happening, and you see a mix of kids on computers and not on computers. And I think when we talk about authentic learning, that's really what it's about. It's giving kids the chance to interact. Uh, and learn in a way that's most important and meaningful for them. So let's try and see, try our luck again and see if I can get um, this video to, to show.
are you? So I think that paints a picture of what we hope to accomplish in our schools uh, with the integration and the usage of technology. And one of the most important things I believe is the concept of agency. And uh, two more slides and we'll wrap it up. Um, and I think these next two quotes uh, to me, if you're truly going to um, embrace or, or seek to allow students to learn in ways that are meaningful to them, in ways that equip them for that ever-changing future. I think student agency is one of the most challenging concepts for us to wrestle with as educators, because there's a lot of worry involved in uh, allowing students to choose uh, what they're going to learn and how they're gonna learn it. And there's obviously a balance to this because there's things that we know we want to expose students to, and there's a foundation we want um, to build in them. We want them to be good mathematicians. We want them to be great communicators. We want them to be social scientists, all these pieces. But we also want to be mindful of the long-term effects of having students uh, be someone who embraces learning for the rest of their life and, and who desire that and who are interested in it and we're able to make learning irresistible for them. Um, so John Holt says, next to the right to life itself, the most fundamental of all human rights is the right to control our own minds and thoughts. As adults, we know this. As, as educators, we know this. We've all sat through in-services um, or meetings where we felt that we had no right uh, to control our own minds and our own thoughts, and we're told what to think and told what to do, and that's very bothersome for us. Uh, but we have to reconcile the fact that in many cases, students can potentially feel the same way. Um, and John says that means the right to decide for ourselves how we will explore the world around us, think about our own and other person's experiences, and find and make meaning of our own lives. Um, and this next quote to me is just incredibly challenging because um, Sean Michael Morris talks about John Holt's quote and says, this is the right of agency. It does not give us power over another, but it gives us mastery over ourselves. And an education that does not encourage or facilitate this agency is not an education. An education that convinces us of what needs to be known, what is important versus what is frivolous, is not an education. It's training at best, conscription at worst. And all it prepares us to do is believe what we're told. And that is, to me, so incredibly challenging because as we're creating curriculum and we're creating uh, opportunities for the things that we want kids to learn, um, finding ways to help them learn how to have mastery over their own minds. Um, so it's not just having kids believe what they're told all the time because I told you so or because an adult told them. It's having the courage to ask questions and question their world and question what they're doing. Um, and I think we have to think about our just cause. And the just cause is the thing that we think is most important uh, to fight for. Uh, because I think of the student who's a, a preschool student in our district, and I wonder what kind of education are we creating and opportunities are we creating for him to be successful in the world, um, for him to make those choices and for him to be well positioned in his life uh, to, to be able to make those decisions and for him to learn the skills that he needs, uh, not just the rote resuscitation of content or not just decontextualized skills that are uh, intervention skills that will make him or drive him away from loving learning, uh, but really creating opportunities for him to learn authentically. Um, I think that's incredibly important. And this is way more nuanced than what we could possibly discuss in 40 minutes here. Um, but I think, uh, again, for the sake of time, uh, I'll wrap it up with that. Um, and I really appreciate, Aaron, and the opportunity uh, that you gave me to share these thoughts and um, the opportunity to talk about just how important this all is. And, and my hope that this is something that we would look at and discuss um, as an educational community. So thank you. Um, and thank you, Ben. I think there are some really interesting ideas here, some really great resources that you shared. Um, I know that I have some more reading to do based on what you just shared. So um, this is really a lovely webinar. And thank you for sharing everything that you're doing with your students. Um, 
We have some time for questions. If anyone has questions, you can feel free to throw them in the chat area, throw them in the questions area. Um, or I can unmute you and you can. Um, um, you can unmute yourselves and ask them, just shout out questions if you have them. Um, I will just remind you that we'll be sending out the slide deck and the recording so you'll have access to everything that Ben just shared. Um, if you have any questions about what Ben is doing in his school, you can follow up with him. Um, he is on Twitter, uh, at Ben Gray, so you can follow up with him there. Or if you have questions about how some of what Ben shared today, uh, how that works with Hapara and how we try to support student agency with our tools, Feel free to follow up with us. We're also on Twitter at Hapara Team, or you can um, email us at community at hapara.com. So I think we can wrap it up. And thank you for everyone for taking the time to listen today. Um, and thank you again, Ben, for sharing everything that you're working on. Thanks, Erin. Thanks for uh, inviting me. I really, really appreciate it. Um, thank you. Have a good night. See you guys. <laughs>